at Subway. Start your day the flavorful way by adding new guacamole to your favorite breakfast sandwich. Perfectly made with a hint of jalapeno, our guacamole turns up the flavor to your breakfast. Try it today on a hot and toasty egg white and cheese. Subway, eat fresh. The BS Report is a free-flowing conversation that occasionally touches on mature subjects. The BS Report. The BS Report with Ben Simmons. Welcome to the BS Report. Tuesday morning here in Southern California. We had a fantastic night at NBA Hoops last night. Might have been the best night of the year. Uh, Grant and Zach Lowe on the line right now. He wrote a column about um, young players at make or break points. We have Dave Damashek coming up a little bit later to talk about the fantasy trade that we made as well as Roadhouse 2 and a couple other things. But now, Zach Lowe, how are you? I'm hanging in there, man. How you doing? So did you watch Portland, Indiana? Uh, yes, I did. I watched it. Uh, I watched it this morning over coffee as uh, the sun came up here in beautiful New York City. Uh, I'm going to phrase the question this way: Why isn't Portland a serious finals contender? Uh, um, because their defense is like 22nd or 23rd in points allowed per possession, and I think there's just a general skepticism that they can build a good enough defense. Um, to really do that kind of serious damage in the playoffs. I mean, that, that's that's the simple answer. They're a great offensive team. They're well coached. Um, they're they're not deep, but they're not shallow. It, it, they're they're a fun team. I just don't think when the chips are down, they're going to be able to defend. Steve Kerr, when he was in the podcast, I think last week we had him or two weeks ago. He was talking about he judges all the finals, all the possible finals teams by can they get multiple stops in a row in a game because that's what needs to happen in the finals. And uh, you know, I, I know that I know what the stats say, but just watching that game, just the eye test of it, it really seemed like they could go toe to toe. I've always liked the way this Portland team shaped out. I liked it before the season because they they have some size, they have the point guard who can create shots and do some stuff, and they have the two shooters. They both Batum, who's been overrated defensively, he's playing a little better this year, and Wes Matthews, who's been really good this year, um, both can can at least give the Paul Georges and LeBrons, make them work for their shots. Um, when you just look at that five, because really the, it comes down to the starting fives and crunch time, all that stuff. That five, what is the weak link to you? Um, again, you know, it, it's going to be defense. I mean, that, that lineup can score. They can be an okay defensive lineup. The last time I checked their five-man data, which I'll do again now, they were – around league average, maybe a little bit worse, which isn't a disaster, but I just don't think, I, I think, I, I, and they're playing, as I wrote last week, they're playing a, a new system, a refined system that sort of imitates what Indiana and Chicago do, and it's it's working well. They don't foul. They're giving up the right kinds of shots, mid-range jumpers mostly. They're defending the three well. I just don't think there's enough sort of uh, top level defensive talent there. I think Wes Matthews is probably the best defensive player of that group, and everyone else is just like kind of okay. And that that to me is is you know can can their system overcome just okay defensive talent? Okay, so now I thought you were going to say the weak link was Robin Lopez, who I like the way he's playing. But if you're talking about okay, how can this team get better? You know, there's a pretty obvious trade sitting there. And the pieces would involve Lopez and Omer Sheik. Now, if you've, I, I mean, we could figure out 40 variations of how that trade would work, but Portland has some assets. They have Lopez as an expiring contract, I think, or not a, you can get out of it this year or next year. He makes six million. Ashik makes 8.3. Portland has some other stuff they can throw in the trade. They have a first round pick, which is something Houston wants to get back for Ashik. Um, let's say the trade was Lopez. Uh, Myers, Leonard, and a number one pick for Ashik. I mean, whatever. Um, now you put Ashik in there instead of Lopez. Does that change how you feel about this team? Well, they owe their pick to Charlotte. Um, oh, I forgot I, about that. So it could be a future pick. Um, well, in the way the protections work, they can't trade a future pick right now because it's top 12 protected, which means, um, Charlotte will probably get it, but it, it, the way the, the way the protections work is that the sort of the Stepien rule works as if you know that trade, since it's uncertain when that pick is going to be conveyed, it's sort of conveyed every season in the future until it actually 
is going to be conveyed. So they don't have a pick to trade. But I agree with you. I mean, that's what makes them. That's what makes them interesting. They're better than they expected. They did not, not even the most optimistic guy within that organization ever imagined they would be fifteen and three. This was like a gravy year for them. We want to make the playoffs. We think we're going to be good. We think we can get 45, 46 wins while developing young talent, while having cap space set up for two years from now. If we make the playoffs, that's awesome. They never thought they'd be 15-3. and three. And sometimes when teams get to that point, they sort of rethink their approach. And I agree with you. They are among the two or three most sort of intriguing Ashik destinations because Ashik is better than Robin Lopez. He be the, by far the best defender in their starting lineup. He'd give them a rim protector. All the weaknesses we're talking about, he addresses. Um, so, I, you know, will they think about taking that kind of step? I mean, again, he makes $15 million next season. His, his cap hits only three. That $15 million is, is, you know, nothing for Paul Allen. That's like a fifth of a yacht or something. Mm. Um, but but it, it's, it's going to dissuade some teams. But I agree with you. They might be the most interesting object destination. Robin Lopez and CJ McCallum for Ashik is an interesting trade. I just thought well, I think, of that. One. I, I think that's the other thing. I, I think if you talk to Neil Olshay, my guess is he would say something like, "This would be a different conversation if McCallum were playing. If if the league could see what he what he's capable of, or you know, on the NBA level, he's yeah. the asset that swings that deal." Because I I don't know. You saw this report. I'm sure that Houston's asking for two first round picks. I have no idea if that's true. I haven't talked to the Houston people in a while. But Robin Lopez is not getting it done as a centerpiece of an Oshik deal. No. No, they'd have to throw in some sort of big, big ass asset. Um what what impressed me last night, and this is this is the reason that I thought Portland was gonna make the playoffs. I didn't think they'd be this good. But you know, they went toe to toe with Indiana in that game. And the bottom line is when you get in a game like that and it's the last five minutes and you're going possession versus possession. They have two guys who can score, not only against anybody, but we're scoring against Indiana, which is about as hard of a, of a team to score against in the league right now. Aldridge is one of the few post-up players we have left in the league, and he's playing as well as he's ever played. Lillard is fearless, and it's the best thing about him. I'm still, you know, it remains to be seen what he's going to be like in multiple playoff series, but at the very least for a second-year player, he's got the kind of attitude and the skills that you'd want and the inside-out game, the two shooters spotting up. I just liked what I saw because I thought Indiana was playing really hard. Indiana's a very, very, very good team. They wanted to win the game. Paul George is playing excellent. And Portland kind of held them off. And they also have a great home court advantage. Um, I, You know, I, I just when people talk about the West, they keep throwing the Clippers in there. I don't see the Clipper thing at all. Um, they keep throwing Minnesota. Finally, the Minnesota things died off a little bit. Houston, I'm not seeing. I think Portland has as good a chance as anybody not named San Antonio to get there. Um, but, you know, just quickly going to the Clippers. You watch, I'm sure you saw the Clippers, Indiana. Um, at what point do the Clippers realize that this is, just isn't going to happen with the team they have? Uh it's a good question. I don't. I don't know. I don't know if they're there yet. I don't know what they can do um, to change course other than trading DeAndre Jordan, and that's another sort of interesting trade piece out there. Not necessarily for an Ostrich trade, but for you know a three-team trade that somehow involves Ostrich. I think Jordan. You know, I don't know that they're there yet. I don't know that Doc is there yet, but that's the piece that can really change their team. Um, and I don't know when they'll get there, but they're a bottom. They're about. They're like 16th or 17th in defense, so they're okay. Um, but yeah, but I, I agree seen, with you. there's no seen difference them. between the Blazers and the Clippers now. And, and when you talk about the Blazers, and I think the Clippers will end up better. When you talk about the Blazers, and you you also talk about the Clippers, and eh, Houston is probably better than we think they are because when they lose, it's so ugly. Yeah. They're solid. Memphis is in trouble. Minnesota is in trouble. And suddenly you look at the Blazers, you're like, you know, they could be they could ascend up a level in the West versus what we thought. Um, and by the way, I just checked their, their starting lineup is just about league average defensively. So it's, it's better than their overall team. So that's, that's solid. Yeah. And, they, and as, as we said earlier, CJ McCollum's going to help. Oklahoma city is obviously in the mix. If, if I had to rank the West teams right now, um, I would do San Antonio one, a and Oklahoma city one B, but I, I think I'd have Portland three. I, I think I'd have Portland ahead of Houston, the Houston situation 
I know they're going to address it. I'm sure there's a trade to make, and that's why it'd be stupid to just say, here are the teams, whatever. But um, the team that Houston has right now is not getting at a round two. Um, I, the pieces just don't fit yet. And the Ashik thing, you know, that was bad. The whole situation with that was bad, especially uh, him quitting on the team for two games, which I, I really do think hurt his trade value. Um, what do you, when you look at Houston, what, what would be the ideal type of player that they don't have right now that you think would help them? Um, well, first of all, I think you're, I think you're too low on Houston and I'm guilty of the same thing because, because the pieces are weird and because when they lose, it's like James Harden is pooping on the court defensively and yeah. Dwight Howard misses a thousand free throws and doesn't look like himself and like throws the ball out of bounds in the post. It's ugly. But they have the fourth best point differential in the league uh, per 100 possessions. They have a very good defense and the best offense right now in the league. I think because of how weird they look and how ugly they look and how the Ostrich situation has been bad, we are collectively underselling how good Houston has been. Now, they have, they've played an easy schedule by Western Conference standards, but they've been very good. In terms of what they need, um, you know, I, I, I think. Everyone's obsessed with Ryan Anderson. I, I don't see that happening for a variety of reasons. I don't think they necessarily... I mean, look, Ryan Anderson would be great, obviously. I don't think they necessarily need a three-point gunner at the four. I'd rather have sort of a gritty defender there who's long and can do a lot of things. I, I, you know, if we're t- talking ideal player prototypes, I'm not sure why someone like Al Horford is worse for them than Ryan Anderson, but you know, Al Horford's a better player. They're not getting Al Horford but maybe like a Paul Millsap type a, a four that's more reliable than, than Terrence Jones. I, I still think is what they need. Although Terrence Jones has been quite good. How about Lou Dang? Lou Dang. I still can't say his name. Even though I'm on a national NBA TV show. Lou <laughs> Dang. Uh, I, I think that Houston is the kind of progressive team who would look at Lou Dang or who would look at Rudy Gay, although, again, they're not going to look at Rudy Gay, but if Rudy Gay were offered to them and were in a, on an expiring contract and they could get him for nothing, I think they would look at a player like Dang or Gay or Jeff Green and say, they're a three, maybe we can turn them into a four. We're already so successful playing Omri Caspi at the four for big parts of the game. What if we got a bigger, longer, better guy? who might be a three traditionally, but we can move him to power forward. I think they'd be open to a guy like that. And I think Deng, who played, I think, 75,000 minutes last night, um, if he can walk, would help any team. Okay, so Omer Arshik, Jeremy Lin for Luol Deng. Who says no? Uh, the Bulls. I mean, you're talking about $30 million of salary. Berlin and oh, Asha combined. Next I forgot season. about the, that. Yeah, yeah. The, the, dual, the, the dual poison pills is just going to be too much for any team. Um, so, but by, and by the way, the shame of that is, together, because of their salaries and their skill sets and the fact that their contracts are pretty short, they'd be a really appealing trade package that could get to Rockets a lot of stuff. It's just those taking on two balloon payments is just going to disqualify basically every team. Yeah, but all right, I'm going to flip that around the other way. Um it's thirty million next year, but it's only ten this year, and they're paying Dang fifteen. So it it would only be it would be forty million total versus fifteen for Dang. I mean, it's not as horrible as it seems. Plus, can't they write off Rose's contract with the insurance if he doesn't come back? There is that's true. There is some insurance policy that they're going to save something on Rose this season. Um, look, I, mean, you, I, I like those players and. That would be an um, interesting trade. You'd, Did you'd, you... cer- you'd certainly be committing to that team for 2014-15 between the Lynn Oshik salary and you, you can't then replace Dang. You can't go out and get a free agent and there are going to be a lot of good free agents. You can't get cap space even if you amnesty a boozer. Um, so that's your team. And you move Jimmy Butler to the free full-time, I guess, or you know, try and fill in what you can fill in with Dunleavy and, and Lynn. It's, 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 it's interesting. I don't see it happening. You know what's also interesting about Jeremy Lin, who I think when we talk about people who, uh, you know, or like just what you were saying about Houston, people are more down on them than they should be. Jeremy Lin's one of those guys who I think now has become underrated. I was looking at the um, the, the sport view stats are just incredible. I, I, I know you live on there all the time, but. 
I'm, I'm okay. trying to dis- I'm trying to discipline myself uh, and to understand them um, a little better. But they're they're interesting. By it's, the way, I mean I it's early with it. the it, it's early with the sample size, but I think you can see some some trends. And one of the things that I was just shocked by was Jeremy Lin is one of the best players in the league at driving to the basket and finishing. It's just a, it's there's the evidence. He's in like the top. I forget six or seven for a number of drives per game and his field goal percentage on those drives is one of the highest at anybody. And it's like, that's one thing he does really, really well is get to the basket. Um, and I was thinking like, man, the Knicks just, just blew it. Just not getting anything for that guy. It was a really, just a really bad business decision. I know, I know the reasons behind it were a little spiteful, but, uh, but man, he, he's somebody that would really help them. I think right now, anyway, yeah, and he was he was up there on the sport view drives per game and, and points per drive and all that last year too. You know, yeah. part of that is Houston's system, which is all drive and kick and move the ball and everyone just go go go. But you know, he he's good. He's shooting fifty percent from the floor. He's getting to the line a lot. Like Jeremy Lin's having a really good year. Certainly a better season, not to twist the knife, but certainly a better season than Raymond Felton's having. Yeah. So the guy who leads the, these stats are great. So you go to stats.nba.com player uh and then the sport or just google sport vu nba and you'll get to the right page um the guy who leads the league in drives right now do you know the answer oh do i know uh how about uh, i don't know the answer and i'm not on the page Uh, i would guess ty lawson a very good guess you're in the top three monte Monte ellis Ellis. the rejuvenated He's got 189 drives in 18 games. He's averaging 10 and a half drives per game. This is great. I love that we have this information now. I I went from being like, oh, stats, come on. You could just, we have a stat. It's called the box score. I went from being that guy to being like, wow, this stuff is incredible. So Jeremy Lin averages 8.6 drives a game, and he scores on 65.4% of them. Monte Ellis averages 10 and a half drives a game. He scores on 47.8% of them. Kyrie Irving averages eight drives a game. He scores on 41% of them. So the point is Jeremy Lin's really good at getting in the basket. And, uh, I'm not sure that the, that, that I feel like that Ashik trade is one of the great wild cards of this season. If the Rockets can get somebody that is just somebody you can go to war with in crunch time in April, May, and June, then I'm going to rethink my opinion of them. I just don't know who that person is. I don't think they do either. Um, I think they have probably a half dozen targets, uh, all, you know, maybe ungettable, maybe semi-gettable, maybe wait and see. And, and if it becomes a wait and see situation, then maybe they, you know, go for future assets instead of present assets. But, you know, it, I agree. It's, it's the first big domino that's going to fall. It might be a three team trade when it happens because of, you know, some of the teams that could really use them don't have a lot of stuff like we talked about with Portland. And Wait, you think be, you think that's the first domino? Well, I mean, look, we've already seen, uh, you know, the Washington domino and Gortat and all that. I I don't know what the first domino is. The first domino might be Toronto deciding, you know, this is it. Even though we lead the Atlantic Division, um, we're not good enough, and we're gonna, you know, make some deals quickly before the best assets get traded to other other places. So it, it could be that. It could be Austria, but. I think after December 15th, I think between December 15th and the trade deadline, like we did last year with Rudy Gay, we're going to see one or two big deals that come earlier than they used to. I'm glad you brought up Toronto because I think I think they are holding all the dominoes right now, and they're about to start rolling them. Because, as you said, a lot of these guys can't get traded till December 15th, so that hinders the ability of who you can get back for what. But Toronto doesn't totally have that problem because the guys that they have to trade are guys that aren't in that November 15th camp. Like Rudy Gay makes $17.8 million. DeRosa makes nine point five. Kyle Lowry's in the last year of his contract. We talked about him the last time you were in the podcast. $6.2 million, which means that he could be in a variety of trades, right? Like he could be in a trade where the team says, we'll give you Kyle Lowry, but you also have to take Landry Fields. They could be in a trade where it's like just Ray Felton and Iman Shumper for Kyle Lowry right now. We'll do it. That trade works. They could say to Indiana, we'll give you Kyle Lowry and Landry Fields 
Or we'll give you Kyle Lowry for Danny Granger's contract, and you have to also take Landry Fields. So they could go in a variety of directions depending on what their goal is for the season. And by all indications, and I think Masai is a really smart guy. You do too. By all indications, they, this is not a team that necessarily wants to make the playoffs. And I think the way to make themselves worse immediately would be to trade Kyle Lowry, which is why I think he's going to be the first domino. What are you hearing about that? Um. I don't know what Toronto is going to do. I, I, I agree with you that I think it's more likely than not they decide sooner rather than later, this is it, we're, we're going to blow it up and see what we can get because the ceiling on this team just isn't high enough. Uh, whether it's Lowry, DeRozan, or Rudy, um, they'll, if, if they go that route, they'll shop all of them. And, you know, the interesting thing about guys like that is, you know, especially a guy like Lowry, who plays a position where every team could use two guys that are good. Um, and so we look at all the contenders and we start to make lists of who needs a backup point or who's one player away, blah, blah, blah. And the problem you run into is like, it's the same thing with Gortat. You know, every team could use a big man, but then you start going through the contenders or the one player away teams and you, and you learn very quickly their contenders or their one player away because they have centers that are better than Martin Gortat. That's why they're good. Or they mm. have point guards playing 35 minutes a game that are better than Kyle Lowry. And so their motivation to trade for Kyle Lowry on an expiring contract is, is, is less than we might think it would be, even though you look at the team like Indiana, you mentioned, or you could even, well, the way Reggie Jackson is playing, it doesn't matter for Oklahoma City, but take Indiana, give C.J. Watson's minutes to Kyle Lowry, and they're probably a better team marginally, but if they're also a team that literally cannot take on an extra cent of money for next yep. season. And you mentioned Landry Fields as an attachment. Uh, to Kyle Lowry, they can't, they just can't take on that deal because they need every cent to fit Lance Stevenson. Mm. I hate when you come back with logic against me. By the way, um, by the way, Landry Fields. Speaking of logic, we need to do like a twenty five hundred word retrospective on the Landry Fields contract. That he he's making it was a three year twenty million dollar deal. I, I, it seems like he hasn't even scored like one point per million dollars since that contract was given out. Well, you could argue pound for pound it's the dumbest free agent contract of all time because the only reason they did it was to try to make it harder for the Knicks to get Steve Nash. And as it turned out, he went to the Lakers anyway. And then as it turned out, you wouldn't have wanted Steve Nash because his body was breaking down. So on every level, it was an apocalypse. And then now they're stuck with Andrew Fields. Maybe it should be a 5,000-word story. I don't know. If if it is... (laughs) It's a remarkable, it's a remarkable NBA saga. And uh, and also the concept of overpaying Landry Fields so the Knicks wouldn't match when he wasn't even good, and the Knicks were probably delighted that somebody was taking it was that they didn't even have to be put in the position to think about it. Um, a guy you mentioned DeRozan, who I agree has some trade value, and, and also the combination of DeRozan and Rudy Gay. We always talk about the f- most fun league pass teams. I think Toronto is an excruciating team to watch. I go out of my way not to watch them. Just It's just those two guys firing up 20-foot jumpers, basically taking turns. I think both of them, they combine their shooting like 38 field goals a game, which is more than LeBron and Wade, which is funny in itself. But um, do you think DeRozan actually has trade value? Um, I, I actually think in a vacuum, DeRozan, I'd, be, I'd much rather have DeRozan on my team than Rudy Gay. Uh, I, he's younger. Um, he gets incrementally better every season. He's a better passer now than he used to be. He's not a great passer, but he knows where guys are going to be. Um, he has improved his jump shot, although we've seen him flirt with the you know hot three point shooting streaks before. And he's much younger than Rudy. He gets to the line. I just think DeRozan's a nice player. Whereas I know what Rudy Gay is. He's older and he's unwatchable. Um, but that DeRozan contract, man, three more seasons after this one. Nine point five a pop for a guy who may just be like a slightly above average offensive wing who doesn't play a lot of defense, although he's a little bit better on that end as well. I, that that's that's tough. Mm. But he some team will definitely there, there are teams that definitely like him. I mean Jeff Green's contract that is I think only one year shorter at about the same dollar value may actually be the same amount of years. Um, he's still got fans around the league, so people like those young athletic guys who can score the ball. They don't run out of suitors until they get older. The guy I'm watching for a possible trade that I haven't heard floated around a lot is Greg Monroe because he doesn't look quite as good as he did last year because of how just that weird situation of the team they put together with those three guys. 
um, Drummond has made a huge leap this year and has just become a steady, you know, one of the, one of the best statistical big men in the league. And uh, they also have to pay Monroe his contract. He's got an extension coming. And it just seems like that's, you know, you could talk about the pieces of a trade that had DeRozan and Greg Monroe in it and uh, and all the expirings that Detroit has. And for the stuff Toronto wants to do, if they could dump some contracts in it, get Monroe back, um, to use DeRozan as, as one of the chips, like it, it, that could get pretty interesting. I'm keeping I'm keeping my eye on the Monroe situation. I think he's going to be in play. What have you heard about that? Um. I mean, there's been speculation about Monroe, including in a column I wrote, you know, way over the summer since since the moment they signed Josh Smith, because it's just hard to see those three fitting together over the long haul. And as you say, they're not dying to pay um, Monroe's contract, and he wants it to be a max contract. They're not dying to pay that for a guy who just hasn't proven himself on the defensive end. He's a very nice offensive player. Um, I, I remember thinking about fake Monroe trades over the summer. Um, and thinking about Washington, but they've already played their big chip, their pick, um, to get Cortot. I remember thinking about Portland, if, if Aldridge became disgruntled no, nope. as an interesting fit, that's now off the table. Um, Boston's in, the, Boston's in there. Hmm? Boston's in the mix. Boston? I think. Yeah, for Monroe. I think that, I think that's a team that. Interesting. That, there's pieces there. Yeah, I mean, so they've got some pieces to move. Um, Detroit's been rumored to be interested in Rondo. I don't know how real that really is. It might um, not even Rondo might not even have to be in that deal. I mean, you could talk about you could do Jeff Green and and picks and whatever. They, there's yeah, Boston's certainly sitting on a lot of assets all of a sudden and a lot of contracts they'd be happy to get rid of if someone would take them, including. Something that um, I don't feel like America is nearly making enough fuss out, out of, maybe because they don't care. But the Celtics have this this Nets pick that is going to go to Atlanta, but then they would get Atlanta's pick. They get whatever is worse between Atlanta and the Nets. Atlanta's a 500 team. Um, now that might change when the Eastern Conference starts playing each other. But for now, I think I think we could safely say Atlanta is going to be like in the 40 to 43 rim range. Brooklyn is having the year from hell. And who knows with them? I don't see them getting past 43 wins either. So now that pick is, you, you could say that pick could be anywhere from 13 to 20. That's a legitimate trade chip in, in this draft. And the Celtics have plenty of chips. Um, so if they, if they wanted to make a move using that pick and some of their players for a Monroe type, I, I think that's a possibility. Um, you, you like this Atlanta team and you like them going into the season. You had like a weird Hawks fetish. They've been in all these games. Last night they they uh, almost beat San Antonio in San Antonio. It's a pretty good team. Could that be our three seed? In uh, I guess they couldn't be the three seed because they're in Miami's division. But could that be our third best Eastern Conference team? Which which is which is maddening, by the way. And I, I keep harping on this, but there's literally no reason the NBA needs to have divisions. And the fact that we have to sit here and think about how the seeding would work because the Raptors lead the worst division in the history of the NBA is stupid. Yeah, the Hawks are okay. Um, they've actually underperformed a little bit, in my opinion. They they had a bad loss to Boston last week where they didn't score at all in the fourth quarter. They yeah. had a couple of shaky losses in the last ten days. Um, they played well last night. They're okay. I mean, but I agree with you. Their their ceiling is not high. They just have no rim protection on defense, no size. Tim Duncan went crazy against them last night for the first time this season, his first really great game. Um, they're winning. It's a three man team. That's amazing. They're okay. It's a three man team. The one the one thing that's been kind of surprising, at least to me, is uh, Jeff Teague. Who knew? This was the guy. He was kind of. The Yankee Christmas swap gift when all the point guards were, you know, changing teams or thinking about changing teams. And Jeff Teague, like, nobody wanted to go after him. And then the the Hawks begrudgingly ended up with him for $8 million a year. And I think he's been excellent. I, I think he's made one of the biggest jumps. He arguably could have been uh, a success story in the column you wrote today for Grantland about young players at, at the make or break point. It's like Jeff Teague is now an above average point guard. I was not expecting that. Did you expect that? Uh, I was, I w- I've always been a, a, a Teague optimist and I've never been able to explain why. Like I remember last, last summer, last spring having conversations with people where I was like, 
adamant that I would take Teague over Brandon Jennings, mm. even though he had an inferior statistical profile. I just like the feel he has for the game, um, the speed and ability he has to penetrate the defense. He's never been the smartest defensive player. He sort of spaces out a lot. He's not shooting well this season. I think he's like 42 or 43 percent. But his passing has been really good. He's crafty. He's craftier than he used to be. He's getting to the line a ton. I think last time I checked, he was getting like seven free throws per 36 minutes. He's a. I, I would, I've been a Teague optimist. I, I, I still wish he would shoot more threes, but I, I can't say I'm surprised he's played well. Um, but you're right. He was like. You know, it was in that stage of free agency where, like, the Bucks and the Hawks were trading, basically trading rosters and going up against each other. And Gustavo Lyon was even involved at one point. It was like <laughs> you were like sharing, they were like sharing players, and nobody wanted the guy. I heard, and I never heard this directly from Danny Ferry, so take it for what it's worth. But I heard that Danny Ferry wasn't a big fan of Teague's game. Yeah. Not, not that he wasn't, you know, was a critic, just wasn't thrilled about paying him a lot of money. But that certainly looks like a good contract right now. Well, in, in sport view, not to keep bringing up sport view, but only five players right now are averaging nine drives a game, and he's one of the five. And the other ones are ones you'd expect, Ty Loss and Monte Ellis and Goran Dragic, who's, who's been fantastic for Phoenix this season. And we, we were talking about um, before the year about how Goran Dragic, what a, what a fascinating trade piece he'd be. I think in the Bill and Jalen preview, I had him going to Oklahoma City at one point. The way he's playing, I'm – I don't think he's a trade piece. I actually would, if I'm them, I would want to keep Bledsoe and Dragic. Um, they've overachieved beyond anybody's expectations of even the craziest expectations. You thought they were going to be a trade partner for a lot of different teams. Do you still feel that way? Um, you know, they're running out of guys to trade, right? I mean, because they traded their one big chip in Gortat. I do think they would move Dragic if they got a good offer for him. If, if they could get a first-round pick for him, whether it's this draft or a future draft, my gut is that they would move him. I mean, he's a nice player. He's having a very good year. They like Bledsoe. They have Bledsoe. Uh, the two can play together. I get it. I, I think they'd rather have a future asset than Dragic, who has, I think, two years left um, after this one, although the last year is a player option. At a decent at a decent price. I think Dragic is a very good player. I, I do feel that they would move him. But the rest of the guys are like, if you're rebuilding, you don't trade Marquise Morris just because you want to get worse this season. He's a young guy. You know, he's overperforming. He's overperforming. What can you do? Um, right. So I think they, if it's if not Dragic, they might be done dealing. And if that's the case, then their path to tanking is sort of like, the, uh, oh, so-and-so's hamstring is sore. He's going to be out for, like, continuously two months. Maybe we'll see that down the stretch from them. But they, they are, they've they been solid, and they don't show any signs yet of being anything but solid. And they're very well coached. Hornacek has been uh, fantastic. And re- really, you watch that team play, and you're like, oh, that now that's a well-run team, as as opposed to some of the other teams we get to watch on, on League Pass nightly. Uh League pass rankings, we did this before the season. Golden State was our number one pick. I feel like they've defended that title that we gave them. We gave them the championship belt of the league pass rankings. I feel like they've defended the belt. With that said, um, I think the Clippers have been a real challenger. Every Clippers game is fun. Um, the team that I did not expect that I feel like is in the top three of this conversation with the Clippers and Golden State. Now, we're removing all the real contenders because it's not fair to put Miami and Oklahoma City in this. Um, New Orleans. Is New Orleans like a wildly entertaining team or is it just me? Well, their their entertainment factor just went down by like 91% because yeah. of Anthony Davis. But yeah, they were really fun to watch. I mean, they're, when Davis is on the floor, they play fast. They have a lot of ball handlers, and it's sort of fun to watch them try and fit, you know, all of those three guys, Evan Holiday and Gordon, together, which they haven't done as much as I thought they would. And then you throw in Ryan Anderson. He's popping out everywhere. Monty Williams runs about 10 different funky little things to get him open. They were really fun to watch. And, you know, unfortunately, we got to speak in the past tense. But, yeah, they uh, they were, you know, look, Anthony, Dav- Anthony Davis' arms by themselves would rank, like, 12th in the league past ranking. They had a 10-day stretch before he got hurt where, I mean, there were teams that were probably as entertaining, but I think they were right there with anybody. And 
Haralabob, our friend on Twitter, the uh, Haralabob Valgaris, who is a longtime NBA gambler. Smart, and, smartest and, NBA fan in the world. Yeah, has great insights and was saying on Twitter, he thought it was the single best pick and roll team in the entire league. And when he said that, I was like, wow. And they, But his big thing was they never run pick and rolls. He doesn't think they're well coached. I don't really think they're well coached either. He made the point that it would really be the all-time greatest Mike D'Antoni team. And if the, well, it's really too bad that there's not a way to to put him in charge of the Pelicans and just kind of just unleash him on what they have. I never thought it would work with all those offensive weapons. I don't think it will result in a title. But as soon as Davis comes back, uh, I just think they're going to have – there will be 10 memorable games of this season, and they'll be involved in at least two of them. And, well, here, uh, here's what would happen if D'Antoni took over that team. Jason Smith's pick and pop 19-footers would be gone. Right. Anthony Davis would play almost the whole game at center. Ryan Anderson would play power forward. Anthony That's, Morrow would start at the three over Amino since he can shoot. Yep. And Gordon at the two, if Holiday is even moderately competent, that team is going to score the you know blow the doors of everyone on yeah. offense, and they'd be entertaining as hell. I wish Monte. Uh, I wish Monty Williams was not the coach of that team. I don't know if he's a good coach or not, but I, I certainly haven't been impressed by the stuff he's done. There's been it's been some bad coaching this year. Let's be honest. They, the Cleveland situation has just been unseemly, and it's really like the perfect storm of everything you'd want from a bad situation, like a poorly constructed roster a poorly coached roster, and then bad chemistry. And uh, everybody seems to think they're going to be involved in a, in a bunch of these trades too. I I would roll the dice with Deion Waiters. You and I have our problems with him, but if you're just talking about him as a heat check guy off the bench with a ton of potential, I he, he's leading that list, whatever that list is. Do you see Do you see him being one of the first dominoes? Um, say the question again. Deion Waiters, will he be one of the first trade dominoes? Um, I'm going to say no, and only because I don't think that team knows what it wants to do yet. Um, and I don't think, and I mean that in the big picture and with Deion Waiters, I think they're hesitant to just give up on the number four pick of the draft, a controversial pick, a pick that Chris Chris and his staff stake all of their reputation on for limited present and future return. And Chris Grant has a reputation around the league for being, I don't want to say difficult to deal with, but he values his own players very highly and, you know, demands a lot of return and trade. So I, I, I would bet no on him being the first domino. So one thing I will say to go back to an earlier point that I don't want to leave unaddressed is I actually think Monty Williams is a good coach. Mm. And I know that he's become unpopular in New Orleans because their defense has been bad for the last couple of years. He does, I think, like mid-range jumpers a little too much, but I, he, he's, I, I like the big picture way that he thinks. Um, I like the fact, I like the way that he uses Ryan Anderson. I think he draws up good plays. Um, and, and he built, I mean, people have already forgotten about this, but CP's last year there, he built a really good defense and a tough team um, that people did not expect anything from with Okafor and West before West blew out his knee. They were a good team that played really solid defense. I, I just think he's young. He's a little too obsessed with sort of old school mid-range NBA basketball. And that may be his undoing, but I like him as a coach. I think he's smart. He's interesting. And he draws up good stuff. I think this is a really good corner for you. Cause there's not a lot of people on the Monte Williams uh, corner right now. You, you should buy the stock. The stock is low. You should just snap it up. It's available. People, I'm, people I'm on it. Down. I'm on the corner. I'm like, I'm like Bodie on the corner right now. I look. I again, too many. I wrote this today. Too many. Or that yesterday with Anthony Davis. Too many mid-range jumpers. Obsessed with Jason Smith pick and pops. Probably you know emphasizes some of the wrong stuff on offense. But I do think he's proven himself um, as a decent NBA coach, and we'll see going forward. But I'm not. I, I've never understood the sort of bubbling hatred for him among Pelican fans. Mm. Last question. Um, what's your finals right now? Uh, wow. I didn't expect this one. 
so early yeah. in the season. I know. Well, uh, it's, it's, it's the answer's going to yeah, change in two weeks. Just throw it at me. Just throw it at me. Let's do it. Let's do it. Gun to my head. The Simmons gun to my head. Oklahoma City, Miami is the final. Oh. Wow, no respect for the Pacers. Naptown just well, took no, a hit. Let's go no, now easy there. Let, let's <laughs> let's go easy. Say picking the back-to-back champs is no respect for the Pacers. You know I love me some Indiana Pacers basketball, right? Well, here, obviously, it was way too early to ask the finals question. I do think that uh, if Indiana can get that one seed, I think they should be the favorite. And I, I just think. The three-peat, all the miles Miami had those last three seasons, and then having to win that game seven in Indiana, it's a lot to ask. I do. I will say, though, I love the way Wade is playing. Even, though, you know, statistically, I don't even think he's averaging 20 points a game, but he looks more Wade-ish than he has in a while, right? Would you agree with that? Yeah, Wade's look, Wade, Wade, when he's played, has looked good, which is encouraging. Yeah. Um, he's, he's, he looks Dwayne Wade ish. He's doing Dwayne Wade stuff. He's doing the weak side blocks. He's doing the drives to the basket. He's playing with the swagger. Um, and B, step, his mid range shot is better this year. Yeah. He, he, it's clear now that he was really hurt in that finals and that it wasn't an old age thing. It was just he was banged up. Um, but the question is, can they get five more months, six more? How many more months are we? Six, seven? Can they get uh, it seven it more like months? 20. Yeah, can they get seven more months at him at this level? And then the X factor for them, I was against the signing. I thought it was ridiculous. I didn't understand it. I thought it was a shot in the dark. Um, Michael Beasley has been a factor. And not just the, the points that and the production he gives them off the bench, but I do think there's something to when you've won a couple titles and you kind of need that new cast member on the TV series, you know? It's like, oh, what's this guy up to? Hey, it's a new new face. Kind of keeps everyone on their toes. You get, people are invested. It, it seems like the entire team is rooting for him. And I think it's a good thing. And, and he's also really good at basketball. You know, if they can keep his head on straight and turn him into this Brian Williams circa 1997 level asset off the bench, that's something they didn't have last year. Um, what are you seeing when you watch Beasley? Um, well, I'm going to pump the brakes on saying that he's very good at basketball. Um, I, I think he's one of those guys who we talk about, like he's so talented, talented, talented. And it's one of the ways that I object to the use of the word talented is that I don't know what that means. Like Michael Beasley is talented. There's no record of him being a helpful NBA basketball player. There's only records of him being a, a completely damaging NBA basketball player. I don't know what talent Solid is. Like if it's like making an interesting, you know, off the dribble scoop shot or something is talent. But like, that's what's interesting about Miami. Udonis Haslam has been playing, and it started because he had back spasms, but it's continued. Shane Battier's minutes are down. Richard Lewis is playing a lot. Michael Beasley is playing a lot. And I think it's interesting. Like, are they are those just bodies that they're using in the regular season to preserve the real guys? Or are those guys actually going to be rotation pieces when the chips are down? And I don't know the answer to that. Beasley's been okay. There's been some games where he has fit in really well with their style. And there have been some games where the ball whips around the perimeter, hits the Beasley, stops. He takes a step in from the three-point line, a huge no-no, and launches a 20-footer. That's bad in their system. So it's it's touch and go, I think, with him. But he's been better than I expected. I should have said very good at offensive basketball. But what what I like about what he does is they didn't have anybody last year other than kind of sort of Mike Miller, who who barely even played last year. But – Somebody can come off the bench and do some stuff for five minutes. And Beasley can get hot. Beasley can score 10 points in three minutes, you know, and he's kind of a monkey wrench. And when he's out there, I'm thinking like, oh, there's Michael Beasley. I wonder what he's going to do. And I think the other team is thinking that too. Hey, this guy does some stuff. Watch out for him. And they just didn't have that last year. They didn't make really any effort to make their team better other than to roll the dice with Beasley and Odin. And if they can turn Beasley into a seventh man, slash irrational confidence forward off the bench who can who can take some shots and give them 10 shots a game and make five or six of them, I, that's an asset. I just think that's going to help them. You don't agree with that? No, I, I, don't, I don't disagree. I mean, I, and look, you watch them. It, Miami plays a different brand of basketball than everyone else in the league on, on both ends of the floor. And you can see Beasley learning, especially defensively, where he's supposed to be how this crazy system works and all of that. And that's a good sign. The fact that you can see him making rotations and moving around the floor the way he should be 
cutting to the right places on offense. That's all a good sign. And again, I just don't know if he's a body or if he's actually going to play when it matters. Even if he's just a body, they've got Lewis and Beasley so that LeBron doesn't have to guard power forwards very often. Between Battier, Beasley, and Lewis, LeBron can go almost entire games guarding wing players but not banging around with big men. And that, that alone is valuable. I've been fascinated by this LeBron season because, I mean, you look at his numbers. Wait, by the way, we're going to argue about Beasley. Uh, we're, this is going to be a continuing argument with us before the season because you know I have a soft spot for, for weird monkey wrenches like Beasley. But um, but LeBron this year, you look at like him, the Cavs, five years ago and the kind of offensive burden that he had in that team. I think during the season he averaged, I'm going to say, 22 shots a game and maybe 11 free throws a game, something like that. This year he has scaled it back to the point that I feel like he goes into these games the same way that Tom Brady, um, the last two Patriots Super Bowls, used to go in the past games. Like, I'm just going to manage the game. I'm going to I'm gonna complete 75% of my passes, and, I, and I'm not going to throw any interceptions, and I'm just going to do everything perfect and put all my teammates in this position to succeed. LeBron's dream game to me, it seems like, would be 25 points, seven rebounds, seven assists, and he takes 14 shots. And it really does seem like he's so focused on the efficiency of what he's doing and just helping everyone else. And the stuff that he's doing game to game, I, I don't think normal human beings can even totally see it. The, the mindset that he has going into the typical basketball game is unlike any other mindset that anybody has right now. Um, do you think he can shoot 60% in the season? 60? Yeah, because that's what I think he's going for. He's at 59-8 right now, and, and I do think I do think he cares. Um, Haralbus I do too. brought this up. Haralbus brought this up on Twitter the other day. Is LeBron getting to the point where he's not shooting enough because he likes the idea that he's the most efficient shooter in the league now? And it, it's worth thinking about. I mean, he's only taking 15.8 shots per 36 minutes, which is the lowest number of his career. It's only down one shot from last season, and he's taking a, a, another free throw game. So, you know, his usage rate, whatever, is about the same. So it's, it's not appreciably different from last season. But I do think it's to the point where it's a fair question to ask. Um, on the other hand, I think he's shown in the playoffs that if Miami needs him to put on the Cleveland hat and shoot 25 times a game, he'll do it. Uh, 60%, I'm going to go no, just because it's just insane. Uh, but 57, 58, uh, I, I think isn't, is it reasonable? He's inching toward the 60, 50, 80 club right now. Yeah. He's at I, 48%, I, you know, is, three point percent. This is one of those things where I'm like, I, it's sort of, I sort of treat it like LeBron's impending free agency where it's like my brain just unconsciously just, I, I can't even contemplate what's going on here. Yeah. I'm going to willfully not look at the numbers because they're just so crazy. He's, he's unbelievable. I mean, there's no – imagine, imagine – years ago. He's gotten to the point where when he takes a three-pointer and his feet are balanced, you're surprised that it doesn't go in. Yeah. And that's that's unfair. He – um, it, it's funny – People are asking me, like, who, you know, the MVP. Oh, this is the MVP's gotten interesting with Paul George and Durant. I think Paul George versus Durant is a really interesting argument. But in my opinion, from what we've seen so far, and, and unless he gets hurt, like, LeBron is just the MVP every year. Like, we, we have to stop. Period. We have to stop pretending, like, oh, it, like, it bothers me that MJ only won five MVPs and when he should have won at least seven, but definitely should have won in 93 and 97 and 93 he lost. Cause it was like, Oh, it's Barkley's year. It's like, no, we, that's, that can't be the mindset. Who's the best, who is the best player? Who is the most valuable player? Nobody does more for their team than LeBron does. Um, Paul George versus Durant. I want to wait like two more weeks and then I think we should have that argument because I think that's a pretty good one. Paul George. I, I think we should wait a few more weeks. I yeah, don't let's think wait Paul a few George more weeks. Paul George is there yet. He's not. Yeah, I mean, I agree he'd have you, to do it in the playoffs, and it, we'd yeah. have to see some series and all that stuff. But just from a load that he carries for a winning team at, versus the load Durant carries for his winning team, it's a really good debate right now from what we've seen yeah. for a month. Um, someone posed this question to me on Twitter just 10 minutes before you called saying, is it time to start discussing Paul George versus Durant? And my initial response was to say, 
in my head, stop being stupid. And then I thought about it, and I was like, you know, I'd, let me look at the shooting numbers. Like, I don't think Paul George's mid-range shooting is going to be this good all year. But his defense is ridiculous. He scored 45 points last night, or whatever it was, 43 points. Um, he's been insanely good this season. And, if and, it keeps and up com- for like crazy enough- confident. Like, the confidence that he has in these games, like, I really felt like he thought he was going to single-handedly bring them back last night in Portland and win that game for them. You know, did you feel that way watching it? I'm watching that game on DVR this morning. And when I get towards the end of a game where it's like garbage time or it's it's to the stage where all the other team needs to do is make free throws and the game is over, I start fast forwarding just to make sure nothing, you know, crazy happens. Last night, this morning, rather, I said to myself, I'm not going to fast forward this game yet because I think Paul George is probably going to do something crazy. Then he hit a yeah. three. Then he stole the inbound pass and almost hit another three. And then it was just like he hit like it felt like he had five threes in the last ninety seconds of the game. He is. Um, he's in the conversation, and we need it. We need a few more months. We need to keep watching. But um, I think he's the third best player in the league. I don't think there's any question. The stuff he does on both ends. He's the best two way player in the league, other than LeBron. Um, Durant versus Paul George is a really interesting conversation. Durant's having a great season again. Um, and all the stuff he does for Oklahoma City. Yeah, but yeah, Durant just had the 30, 10, 10, right. 4, 4 game or whatever the hell it was. It's not like he's slipping. Um, but Paul George is, is, it really seems like he learned from that experience last year and it motivated him and it made him better and it pushed him to another level. And I never ever thought he was going to be this good. Um, it's certainly, uh, he has a chance, like when you think like where he went, what was he, the 10th pick? Yes, 10th pick. Let's see. I'd have to look at the list, but when you're talking about like, you know, the best players pick 10 and later in a draft, he's got to be on that list. It's just, it's insane that they got somebody who's this good with the 10th pick. I believe and was Dirk nine or 10. Dirk was, uh, Dirk, Dirk, I think was nine. Paul Pierce was 10. Um, Kobe, of course, was 13. Maybe. Yeah, I mean, that's that's how it has to happen usually with, like, you get lucky with a high school or something. But I may or may not have something in my archives uh, making fun of Indiana for not taking Xavier Henry over him. I should destroy that. I should probably get yeah, rid of that. Yeah, you, you need to get rid of that. But let, let's say this, though. I do agree with you. All of these discussions, like, every two weeks there's a cute thing like, oh, man, look at Kevin Love. Should he get MVP consideration? And look right. who's hot now. Is, is, you know, Russell Westbrook a top five NBA MVP guy? Should where, Where's the, you know, blah, blah, blah. It'll happen for James Harden and Dwight at some point. And you're like, after a while, it's like, these are all cute. Like, it's nice, but LeBron is the MVP, and, like, all this other stuff is just noise. Yeah. I mean, well, people, we have to come up with stuff to talk about. The Kevin Love stuff made me mad because they were like six and three and we were doing a show that week and, and there was like Kevin Love MVP buzz. It's like, let, let's see them, let's see them at least get to like 10 and five before we think about this. And now they're below 500. But I think the Paul George thing is, you know, watching what they did in back to back nights, uh, against the Clippers and in Portland against two of the, probably the six best teams in the league. And uh, the confidence that they play and how important he is to that team. Um, I would probably have him as my number two MVP. I don't know if he's the second best player, but, you know, it's freaking early, which is which is why this is white noise, as you said. Zach Lowe, um, always a pleasure. And uh, and we will keep reading you on Grantland. Keep up the good work. Talk to you soon. Thank you, sir. All right. We're going to call my friend Damashek. But before we do that, wanted to mention our sponsor, Stamps.com. If you check out their website right now, you put in the letters BS and you get a deal on a whole bunch of stuff. You get a scale. You get $55 off a variety of postage. And here's why that's important, because it's Christmas time. This is time when you start mailing packages and you start mailing boxes and doing all that stuff. You need stamps.com. Why would you want to wait in the post office? Don't do it anymore. Go to stamps.com. Do everything from your house. Make it your own personal post office. Do it for the holiday season. You won't regret it. Stamps.com. Check it out. And now, time for our friend Dave Damashek, an old friend of the BS Report, an old friend of mine, and somebody who was really a friend two weeks ago when he gave me Josh Gordon for Livion Bell. Uh, Dave Damashek, how are you? Well, I'm not well. I have egg on my face, and, uh, and, and I don't appreciate you, sir airing my dirty laundry for all the world, or at least the digital world, to see, sending out tweets mocking my 
now clear was what's clear now was a was an awful apocalyptic trade of uh, of one Josh Gordon. Is it first of all? I didn't do anything. You were the one tweeting about the trade. I wasn't even going to tweet about it. You tweeted about it. Then you tweeted about it again. Then you did it a third time. And then at that point, I just felt like you were waving red meat in front of my face. Yeah, I suppose so. I suppose so. You know what? Listen, when, uh, you know, you know me. You know that uh, like uh, the late great Jerry Orbach at the end of Dirty Dancing says to the late great Swayze, "When I'm wrong, I say I'm wrong." And I felt I had to make some sort of acknowledgement of the error that I had made. How could I have known that Josh Gordon was about to do this? Though this, I mm. mean, you know, I, I, in honor of you, I was try. I was I was going through my memory bank in uh, in pop culture, trying to figure out what movie. It, this this is most like, and I, I of course I land on the uh, sports guy classic Teen Wolf. I oh. really am like Pamela, am I not? All of a sudden, you know, I didn't know anything about Teen Wolf. I didn't care about Scott, aka Michael J. Fox, before he gained these magic powers. Mm. Now I'm the heel that he's that. Uh, now that uh, Josh Gordon's the BMOC, I I feel like a jerk. Too little, too late. You are boof in this situation. I'm boof. I don't want yeah, to be you're boof because you wind up with you wind up with Teen Wolf. I feel like I'm Pamela. Wait well, a whatever. second. No, I'm Pamela. Don't you? Say no, you're it. boof. You 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 love Scott Howard when he wasn't Teen Wolf yet, but then all of a sudden he became Teen Wolf, and Pamela got to go on dates with him. Doesn't that make me Pamela? I Josh Gordon know. will come back to you next year, and then you'll be boof again. All I know is boof you and Deuce. <laughs> Levy and Bell sends a message. He wants double Deuce in the finals of the uh, of the uh, fantasy Super Bowl. Here, we hope to see you in a couple of weeks. Well, you know what was great about that trade? You love the Steelers so much. Um, you you wanted to trade me a receiver, and I I had an extra running back, and you wanted Alfred Morris, Alfred the Butler, who I didn't want to trade because he'd had like five straight hundred yard games or something. Right. But I knew you loved Mr. Bell. And I know you love the Steelers, and you had a receiver to trade, and I just figured we'd land in the right spot. Plus, we had the Thursday night deadline. That Thursday night deadline leads to a lot of irrational decisions in general. I felt like I was up against it, and yeah. in defense of uh, my logic, this was not some blinded by black and gold, uh, you know. And, and but now that said, for the record, philosophically, whether you're from Pittsburgh or Cleveland or anywhere else uh, in, uh, in the face of the earth. It makes better sense to, generally speaking, forget the name. Isn't it better to have a Steeler on your fantasy team than a Cleveland Brown? That just sounds better. It's a, it, it's probably um, gonna, you know, gonna wind up better for you in the long run. So that was one thing. Well, now, and also you throw in the throw in the quarterback part of it. You know that Whedon is now his quarterback again. Well, they, they, I didn't, but, but you know, I can't, I can't use that as the excuse because it was still Jason Campbell. Oh, was it still Jason Campbell? Oh, yeah, I'm he got sorry. hurt during the during the game raft. against Pittsburgh. So yeah, so yeah. I so I can't rely on that. But I listen. I needed a running back. I had the the big part, the big miscalculation by me was over optimism about Percy Harvin, who was a receiver that I've now stashed on my bench all season long. Um, yeah. under the assumption that when he comes back, he's going to immediately be gangbusters. And, of course, he played he, – what did he, he – caught one pass a plays. couple weeks ago. You were, it doesn't even play. So that's where you were I got trying to trade him. You were trying to trade him to me, and I was like, uh, I need to see him play like three games. Can I see three games from Percy <laughs> Irvin? He played 16 I plays I as hip yeah. I Listen, I got ruined by Doug Martin. Doug Martin going down, left a vacancy. In the, uh, I don't in the roster. That I don't want to hear it. Everyone in the league, this is the story of fantasy football this year. It's almost like the real NFL. You start out with the team you think you're going to have, and then you lose two guys. I lost Aaron Rodgers and, and Randall Cobb. Just gone. Wiped off my team midway through the year. Never to be seen well, again. I'll tell that's you, never more so. Than, I, mean, I always like, I, well, that's exactly, well, that's also, that's also who I went after, as you know. I asked you about Aaron Rodgers, and you said, absolutely not. I need him for the playoff run. Now you're not going to have him. Um, it Are would you appear, sure I'm not going to have him? I, well, I don't know. It depends. I guess it's going to be based largely on what happens this weekend with the Packers. If they lose, they're out of it, and they'll shut them down for the rest of the season. Maybe you could use your juice and put a call into Mike McCarthy and pull some strings and get him to play for your fantasy team. But well, he, but here's the, the thing with Aaron Rodgers I've been thinking about. Obviously, I've been thinking about it nonstop because we're all losers and we think about our fantasy teams too much. You start Aaron Rodgers, right? 
he re-injures the collarbone halfway through the first quarter and he's out again. Now I'm now I'm getting the minus the the plus three for my quarterback when I need at least twenty to compete in a playoff game in fantasy. Is it even <laughs> worth the risk? This like, is, I, I'll, I'll tell you this. I listened to uh, to you and Corolla talk about Paul Walker and the Fast yeah. and the Furious uh, franchise. I didn't realize until I heard that podcast. This is very similar to that. That the real victim here is Bill Simmons. That's is that uh, the Green Bay Packers are <laughs> well, whatever happens with their season is uh, besides the point. It's your fantasy team that's the real issue here. Yeah, I, you know, fantasy football has become well, pro football, in fact. It really is very similar to you know injuries are going to come. It's really like a uh, a game of Jenga because every you know for certain that pieces are going to be removed over the course of the season. You just never know which piece is going to make the whole thing collapse. And clearly, in the case of the Packers, you take Aaron Rodgers out of the mix, and and they just become one of the most abysmal teams in the league. Who else really has that impact on his pro team as much as Aaron Rodgers? Probably your guy Tom Brady. Maybe Calvin I, I, Johnson. I think Rodgers is number one because um, it, it just exposed a lot of weaknesses. They they don't have a very good team just in general. And I, McCarthy is one of those guys. Like he won a Super Bowl, so it's kind of hands off. But man, if if you just remove that Super Bowl, I know it's impossible. And you just judge him off what we've seen the last three years. He would be one of the bottom ten coaches. I never come away from a Packers game thinking, wow, that team's running on all cylinders. Like, have you ever watched a Packers game in the last three years and felt that way? Well, that's a, that's a, a really interesting point because of the ebb and flow of the roster, and it's all about depth, and that's why Seattle is so good, given that we're in the age of, of just injuries. 2013 is the all-time apocalypse. I don't have the numbers, but anecdotally, does it not seem like not just big names? I, I don't talk – you know, Adrian Peterson obviously goes out – and everybody uh, focused on that a couple of years ago. But just in, in, in raw numbers, there can't have ever been so many injuries in an NFL season as there have this year. So, yeah. It, well, because the concussion thing, they're so much better at recognizing it and right. giving these guys. So it seems like just everybody's out for a week or two weeks. My dad was complaining about he doesn't like where football's heading. And just with with the amount of injuries they have and the fact that like you start the season with your team and then 12 games into the season it's like you're watching a different team we had guys in the defense in that Houston game the patriots that uh we we had one guy I was like where did that guy come from I'm googling I'm like oh this guy's on our defensive line now he's playing third downs never heard of this guy before friday um but that just seems like what the league is like now it is yes anyone who uh, who attempts to use injuries as an excuse is, um, you know, lives in a, in a narcissistic bubble uh, with the under the assumption you're the only one dealing with it. Every single team that the, the the other teams that are injured are every single one of them. Everybody takes injuries. Like I say, it's the Jenga effect. You don't know who's going to cause your entire season to go down the tubes when you pull out when you remove him from the equation, but. I thought that the Patriots were doomed. For instance, when I thought when I saw Vince Wilfork, I thought that it you know was a it was a savvy observation to say that's the real linchpin of of yeah. New England. You take him out of the mix, they're going to and Mayo. He, Don't forget Mayo. We, that, well, Mayo is huge too. And, and as a matter of fact, I still think that in the slow burn of the season, I still think that the Patriots are in bad trouble because of those two injuries. I, I the no question New, the the Denver game a couple weeks ago made me made me think. This is going to be awfully hard for them to go on at minimum a three game run and not get exposed by one of these playoff teams. You know, I'm, t- I'm talking into January. There's but a how many times that- hey, I felt the same way about the Bengals? Like I've been picking against the Bengals because they lost Geno Atkins, your buddy Geno, right? And uh, they lost Leon Hall. And you th- and you think like, all right, well, those are their two best defensive players. This should hurt their defense, but for some reason. It hasn't like they San Diego only scored 10 points last Sunday. That doesn't make sense. No, I know. In Cincinnati, they're they're very quietly, you know, they're they're a punchline for many reasons for the obviously for the decades. And then Andy Dalton has emerged as a guy who is the big question mark. And that's the narrative of the season. But very quietly, they're eight and four. They're one game behind your Patriots. And if you look at the schedules, you can make a reasonable case that the Patriots could lose a couple of games the rest of the way here and the Bengals could wind up even with the second seed in the conference 
which I guess is the, the takeaway from that is I, I agree with you that it's surprising that the defense in Cincy has sustained. And then that's another question for another time is how has Mike Zimmer never been an NFL head coach when there's such a dearth, obviously, for quality coaches? How this guy hasn't gotten a shot yet is, is uh, loco or at least curious what, what's going on there. But either way, yes, the, the AFC in general, the point is, I guess, is that it's just not very good. I know we could have this conversation quite a bit, but, you know, over the last few years, but they're really, who in the AFC is truly uh, impenetrably scary to you? I mean, the only thing that comes close to it is is Denver, but then, of course, you know, I, I'm a cynic and a hater and everything else for pointing it out, but the fact is Peyton Manning's 9-11 in the postseason and continues to not look good when it gets chilly outside, which is the craziest piece of kryptonite for one of the supposed all-time greats in his sport ever. Hey, yes, he is. He's, uh, according to NFL Network two years ago, he was rated the eighth-best player in football history. Not not quarterback, you understand. The eighth-best yeah. player. So it's a pretty weird little uh, uh, picadillo of him. He doesn't like it when it gets chilly outside. That's the only asterisk he gets, is that it's, if it's chilly, he's not as good anymore. So, well, think about, well, but think about what wimps we are now that we've been on L- in L.A. for too long. I went back to Chicago for the college doubleheader that the Wiggins and Rando, all those guys. Uh, and, uh, and Chicago was like, you, you lived in Chicago. You know how cold Chicago gets. Yeah. And it was like an average cold Chicago day. It was like 12 degrees and windy. And it's just like a basic Chicago winter day. I was like decimated by it. I had on this giant heavy <laughs> jacket. I was still freezing. Every conversation I had was about how cold it was. Like, and I do wonder when these quarterbacks that play, in domes or like Drew, you know, Drew Brees is another example. Drew Brees is in New Orleans and, and then you go and you, and you go into that cold weather. I, I don't see how they're not thinking about it at least a tiny bit. Whereas Brady is in Roethlisberger. Those guys are just conditioned to play anywhere. And that's been their whole career. I think it's a yeah. factor. It, it's absolutely, listen, a couple of things about, uh, about the way 2013 specifically uh, sets up for, for January. You know, I've been saying for six or eight weeks now, I uh, looked at the schedule back in, uh, in early October and, and circled the game on Monday night in Seattle saying, is, is, has there ever been, has home field ever been more significant in the NFL than it is in the NFC 2013? Because if you have to go through Seattle, which it now appears any team's going to have to do, who's going up there in January out of the NFC in raw, rainy Seattle and knocking off that team? The answer, it's it would not. seem, is nobody. And then, but then the flip it around it, the other side, the AFC, I feel like anybody can win anywhere. Exactly, that's right. And, and by the way, if New Orleans had won on Monday night, it's almost as tough to go down through New Orleans for anybody, just about, yep. including Seattle. I would, I would probably say that the Saints are favored to take them in the Superdome if it was Seattle going through there in the postseason. But yeah, now on the other hand, you know, in mile high, Peyton Manning in the snow, people can defend all he wants. Oh, look at the statistics and, and, uh, and Barnwell on your side, I know, uh, uh, does that and, and cites statistics, but the eyeball test proves that he simply is not as good when you watch him when it's chilly outside, which is an, like I say, is, is insane to me that he is the quarterback in Denver where it snows and gets cold in January. Right. And let's say he survives that. This is now a humongous factor. Whether you like it or not, I kind of like the idea of a Super Bowl in New York City, and it might snow and everything else. That, that I've come, it, I've come around on it because I actually wrote this in my column last week that um, the every those cold weather games are always awesome. Yeah, when you can see exactly as soon as you can right. see someone's breath, it's like it gets really good. And I, I think some of the watershed games that we watched when we were growing up were cold games. Bengals Chargers was a freaking iconic game. I remember where I watched that game. You know, and if the Super Bowl ends up being like that, then it really is like, all right, this is when the real men, when men are men, you know, well, cold listen, field, I mean, hard about, field. When the Giants, actually, you well, it's a nightmare for you, I guess. But remember the when the Giants went up to Lambeau a few years back when mm. your team was undefeated on the other side. That game with the, like you say, with the breaths and the, all, all that stuff. It's, it becomes uh, more iconic for those, uh, you know, because you can see how cold and bitter it is. And, uh, yeah, you know, but it, it was early February, let's say it's snowy. Let's say it's 10 degrees outside. It is a massive factor, as you point out. Obviously, Ben Roethlisberger is not going to be there, but there's a chance Tom Brady will be. 
And if it is, on the other hand, Peyton Manning getting there against Seattle, who you got in that one? Who do you think is going to win that game with the way uh, Seattle hits as hard as they do and those big DBs and everything else? Obviously, Seattle would be the heavy favorite. I, I, I can't imagine who would say, oh, yeah, Peyton Manning's going to rise to the occasion in, in uh, frigid New York City and take down that Seattle defense. I mean, it's, it, it's hugely important. And you think about it again. The Saints coming out of their dome, could they go up there and win? No. Could San Francisco? Maybe. If Aaron Rodgers is done, then they're out of it. It really boils down to, like, who's who do you even like in that situation if you get to the Super Bowl? I don't like Peyton Manning and the Broncos in the cold. I don't I like... Don't either. I either. I, I, mean, I said this in September. I, I think that you can look really awesome in September and October when you're a high-octane offense, but at some point you're going to have to do it um, you know, in in the raw elements in New Orleans, didn't New Orleans not have to play a game outside when they won four or five years ago? Wasn't that how it worked out? They went dome dome, and then the Super Bowl was. I yeah, that's, uh, that dome. sounds right. Yeah, they would have been. Yeah, they were the number one seed. So yeah, so that would uh, that would have been. Uh, yeah, and then they play, of course, south in the in the warm. You know, the crazy thing is too, in a related matter with this sort of thing. You know, there are all these conditions on whether Peyton Manning can get it done in certain elements, and Andy Dalton's the linchpin of an otherwise loaded Cincy team. It begs the question that I've been asking for the last month. How is it possible, with every rule in pro football now tailored to benefit not just offense, but the passing game specifically, and all the attention paid to it from the age of 14 or 15, if you can spin it, you'll go to an academy and work with Joe Montana or who knows who else to get there. And college offenses are now specifically tailored to the passing game to groom these guys to be NFL QBs. How is it possible in a world with 7 billion people that there aren't 32 guys that can successfully play quarterback? How is it possible that there are like 20 guys that are good at it consistently? Well, and even going further, punters always has been more amazing to me. (laughs) That's another good one. Yeah, that's right. How do we not have 32 frustrated soccer players who couldn't make the World Cup or goalies? These goalies can kick the ball across the entire field. We can't find 15 goalies who can punt? Nick Saban agrees. He's upset about uh, his inability (laughs) to find a place kicker. Same sort of thing. Have you written off the Steelers? You're done? No, but listen, I'd like to think that I still have a shred of dignity, and I would like to see the Steelers do it. And by the way, as a side note, too, because I'm looking at it on my TV screen as we're talking, this Mike Tomlin business, every week there's got to be something that the residents of Mount Pius get up there and look down on on us human beings and wring our hands at the state of uh, of society. I find this, because I'm under no obligation to say otherwise, I can say this freely, I found it, if nothing else, very funny. I enjoyed it quite a bit, and so did he, and so did everyone on the sideline, and so did the Ravens. And maybe it would have been different if the if the Steelers had won the game. Then it would yeah, be the really... Ravens won. Ultimately, who cares? The Ravens won. Like it's right. not, it would no be funny though, but it got the other way. How much bigger a story it would be than it already is. Yeah. Um, well, but, but don't uh, you think it's a big story because just because it's one of those coming out of the weekend where there weren't a lot of things to talk about. And this allows talking head guys to come in and be like, uh, guys, if you're the coach, you have to make sure you're not on the field and make all those stupid points. It's That's the, how it works. It, the fascinating part of it is the are the are the back and forth apologies and public statements that obviously are scripted by a spokesman for, or, or uh, a player's agent or the or the team official and the back and forth. And it really ultimately for whose benefit are all these things when people apologize and then it's accepted publicly and I, it's time to move forward uh, with all that kind of stuff. Re- who's the show for? I really am fascinated by that, but the, to I answer your question, question. It's, it's a terrible thing. The, 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 and that thing is the AFC this year. I know some people would like to celebrate it by calling it parody. But I call it mediocrity. That's you know, it's you can change names of things to throw people off the uh, the trail. Like I've said many times, it's the same attempt by former uh, the the uh, occupation formerly known as stewardess is now now it's upgraded because now they're flight attendants. See, so there's no stink on it anymore. Secretary, what's the secretary? No, it's an assistant. Understand? Same sort of thing. Now it's not <laughs> mediocrity. It's not that nobody is good. 
it's parody. Isn't that great, everybody? Look, everybody's about equal. Um, yeah, it's, it's not great, and I'm not proud to say that the Steelers are still in the mix here. But as it happens, if they can go, and I've talked to a few guys back in Pittsburgh who really have broken it down, um, the Steelers can go 8-8 eight and eight and get into the playoffs, as ridiculous as that is. Well, I mean, Baltimore's, they really have everything Baltimore's in terms win. of tie break. But it, they can really get some tiebreakers, and if the only game they lose is at Green Bay coming up here. They go 8-8, eight and eight, they probably do sneak in as the sixth seed. Well, you play Miami this week, so you win that game. Now, now you've basically extinguished them because you'd win any head-to-head. Baltimore is home from Minnesota, but then they're at Detroit, home from New England, at Cincinnati. I think yeah, they I mean, lose two, br- they lose two or three Baltimore's got a really tough uh, – uh, I mean, what's, which is the game that you even look at there in general for them? Minnesota is not a gimme at this point, I wouldn't say, especially the way Baltimore yeah, plays. No ba- yeah, no Baltimore game's a gimme because they're not that good. Uh, yeah. I think Tennessee's out of the loop. I think San Diego's taking themselves out, and the Jets have taken themselves out. And if it gets to where you're at least tied with Baltimore, you split the series with them, and then what does it come down to, D- division or conference? I think the killer for Baltimore, if they fi- if they wind up even the Steelers and and Baltimore, the uh, the killer loss for the Ravens will have been losing to Cleveland. That's the tiebreaker because it's the division head to head they split. So then it goes to division record and uh, and Pittsburgh. And uh, this assumes that Baltimore loses at Cincy to close out the season. The Steelers would have the edge in division record against them. Yeah, I think they're the most interesting of all. The, like, Baltimore's just not very good. Miami's not very good. Pittsburgh's at least mildly scary because of Roethlisberger and the fact that he can turn it on. He's not going to be afraid of the big stage and the whole thing. Wait, before we have to go, but before we go, we just quickly, um, it looks like they're remaking Roadhouse. I know you're yeah. as upset as anybody. Um, just 20 seconds on why this can't happen. I, I'm, you know, I wish I had words for this. This is too big for me. I don't, I don't, I mean, just let's destroy it all then. I mean, let's, let's shut it down. Shut it all down, Bill. Rip down the Eiffel Tower. Rip down the pyramids. <laughs> What's the point of anything anymore? Nothing's sustained. It's over with. If we're remaking Roadhouse, if we're spitting on the grave of Patrick Swayze in this manner, what else? What else, Bill? I, you're right. Here's the only thing I would sign off on. You could talk me into a Roadhouse TV series. You could talk me into taking it a whole other direction and just laying the groundwork. And now it's like this guy takes over this bar. You get three episodes at it, just him turning the bar around. And now he's got this villain coming after him. And it could be a little bit like justified on FX, like that kind of mindset. You could talk me into that. But not another Roadhouse movie. I, you don't need to remake something that is still exceedingly watchable. I mean, just, you know what? Hollywood, grow up. Get a new idea. I don't know what to tell you. Do what you want to do. You, you've already, you already remade Red Dawn. Fine. But this is, this is it. You know, shame the devil if you move forward with this. There's no more sacred cows. It's over with. I'm sick of my... Re- they made a remade Red Dawn, but we don't appre- we don't acknowledge that in the Simmons house. That's exactly well. You're uh, you and you and me both. And by the way, just real quick, you and Corolla. The one thing you get wildly wrong is the idea that that Fast and the Furious is the greatest movie franchise of all time. How could you say that when Star Wars is in the world? Well, no. Well, it's my favorite movie franchise of all time. Oh, my all right. point was that out of all the movie franchises we've ever had. It's the first one we've seen that conceivably could just keep going and going. They could release one every year for the next 10 and probably pull it off. Whereas Star Wars, I don't think that's possible. Raiders of the Lost Ark, Die Hard, you go down the line, really the only type of franchises that are possible with that are the horror movie franchises, but even those die out. Fast and Furious uh, is the only what? one that has gained steam as we've gone along. The, you know what, before you go, real quick, that reminds me, the, uh, when you say Indiana Jones, this is something I've wanted to bring up to you for some time. I wanted Please. to put, put you to work on this and, and uh, your listeners, because I think uh, this, is, this threads the needle for you. What is the greatest, for one actor, what is the greatest movie streak in history? Oh, it's funny. We were just talking about this uh, in the Grantland office yesterday, because these are the kind of conversations we have. Hanks has had a couple amazing ones. Hanks has had a couple good ones. 
I'm going to – are you going to say Harrison Ford with, uh, what was it, Raiders, Jedi? Here's his streak. Let me just float this one at you. Okay. The greatest movie streak in my book, and I've, and I've investigated this uh, thoroughly. Okay. I defy anyone to, to, to beat this one. Here goes this – is, this is Harrison Ford. Listen, listen to what he does. He goes, Empire Strikes Back, in mm. which he plays Han Solo. He follows that up with, Bla- with, with, I'm sorry, Raiders of the Lost Ark. He premieres himself as Dr. Jones. Then Amazing. Blade Runner. That's mm. it. I mean, what else needs to be said? I mean, he, he goes from being Blade Runner, Indiana Jones, and Han Solo. I mean, you know, what would any human being give to have play even one of those guys, let alone three? Then he goes, Return of the Jedi, then mm. Temple of Doom, mm. then he's John Book and Witness. Now, that's, oh, wow. I mean, that's as titanic a, a run as you could have. If you can let Mosquito Coast go, which is, you know, uh, on the edge for me, I, I really don't like it. But if you can let that one go, then Frantic, then Working Girl, now, then Now, you're done with Crusade. Frantic. Stop with Frantic. Stop. You, you just had the, you had the run. Frantic is fine. Here, you, you, you'll uh, cut it off there? Fine. But anyway, go ahead. You try and beat that one. Hanks, you're right. Hanks is uh, on the right I'm track. I'm going to go Hanks right now. Hold on. A League of Their Own, Sleepless in Seattle, Philadelphia, Forrest Gump, Apollo 13, Toy Story. Bam! Plus that two Oscars. Not, oh, come, I mean, that is a very impressive run, but that is not superior to the one that I just reeled off for you. I'm talking about the all-time movie roles of Rick Deckard and, and Indy Jones and, and Solo. I mean, you know, those, those are nice movies by Hanks, but come on. I got one more for you. Eddie Murphy. Lay it on me. Um, 48 Hours, Trading Places, Beverly Hills Cop, Golden Child, Beverly Hills Cop 2 coming to No, America. no, 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 no. You, you, just, you just tried to slip Golden Child past me, and I'm not going to allow it. I, I also didn't mention Best Defense. <laughs> <laughs> There's always that one in there that breaks the yeah. streak. That's why the Turn streak the is so ball. impressive. So Joe you're DiMaggio saying Joe got a hit in every game. There wasn't one where he went over. You understand? So you're That's saying part the, of part of the streak is that there's no offers. It's just hit after hit after hit. Boom, 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 boom each time. That's right. That's what I'm getting. All right. At. I'm going to have to research this and I'll, I will continue this on another BS report. Dave Damashek, as always a pleasure. Uh, we will talk to you soon and we can check out your stuff on NFL.com. Doing a lot of good work there. Follow me you. at Damashek if you would. I tweet out my podcast, all that jazz. And thank you thanks. for uh, thanks again for Josh Gordon. Listen, Talk to you soon. In the long run, this is going to win out. Levy and Bell forever. <laughs> Take care. Target the sound off. Whoa! Thank you for downloading the BS Report with Bill Simmons. Too much fun. Check out more podcasts at the iTunes Music Store or at PodCenter at ESPNRadio.com. Peace out. Geico presents Strange Savings Stories. Astronomers detected an interstellar transmission. It stated, Geico, 15 minutes could save you 15% or more. The implications were staggering. Was the cosmos telling us we could all save hundreds on car insurance with Geico? Or did their radar merely pick up a signal from the nearby Rufus and Clyde's morning show? We may never know. Geico, 15 minutes could save you 15% or more on car insurance.